Hello. Hey. Due to the construction, since you're actually going to be talking, construction? yeah, next door, trust me, if you're in the other room, you can hear them like sanding the wall and everything. So I moved over here. Where should I sit? Wherever you want. That's the phone. Okay. So I can move over. So do, do, I forget, do people like type comments or no? Yes. Okay. But I can't hear. They will be muted for audio quality. Great. How long is your shift today? Didn't get here till 10. 10 p.m.? Mm -hmm. That's the one the last one we're getting closer to the end. You're getting We're a lot getting of people. Why wouldn't it? Are you learning something? Well, yeah. <laughs> but it should. It so, does my best before. <laughs> it's okay. We have four minutes. Okay. We're good. So basically I'll start I'll go through my slides, introduce you mm -hmm. turn it over to you. You do your song and dance. Do you do this? Yeah, I'll do that, okay. and then I toss it to you to do. Okay. Cool. Objectives. Okay. Where cool. your objectives come from? Cool. And then I come back on at the end. Granted, it's easier when we're both in the room, so it's like I'm not want to slide deck stuff. But then I'll come back on and do the the wrap up. Ask okay. if there's any questions. Moderate questions. Don't have high expectations that you'll get questions. No, I won't. I just want to be prepared. Because <laughs> some people, like, they feel bad. Like, oh, they didn't ask any questions. Like, oh, no, 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 10. Unless David Reynolds is in the audience, you probably won't get any questions. Which I'm fine with. <laughs> I'm okay but, with no questions. Some presenters, like, they like questions. They feel like. Oh, I feel bad for the one that had nobody. <laughs> I don't think he realized it was nobody. He was late himself, and so, <laughs> and I didn't make a call. I said, okay, are you ready? It's showtime. Let's go. We don't have time. So, and then I just went in and started the recording. I'm sure he has no clue that there was, like, no one listening. Well, more people will listen. After. That's right. When I get to the That's knowledge right. library, it'll be wonderful. Oh, these will be in the knowledge library? Cool. Is it free for everyone or just members, you know? World FM Day is free for everyone. Oh, for, so knowledge library. Well, once it gets put in there, I don't know. Okay. I don't track that. That's their problem. <laughs> My problem is the front end. I can actually say that too now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I'll I'll keep track of time. I. Okay. Or you just tell me to speed up if I'm. Because I added a few slides. I did this presentation before for staff. Yeah. I added a few slides and changed kind of the angles. Oh, okay. So hopefully, hopefully it'll be. Were the added slides included in what you sent to Marcus? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I just added them, Josh. <laughs> oh, no. I've had presenters add things up to the minute, and then they're mad at me because they expect me to like rearrange their whole slide deck, and it's showtime. Well, then we have to start. We have to start. If you didn't give me the slides about 30 seconds before the GD presentation, uh, you know what group does that. I bet you can get Really? Yep. <laughs> oh, they're a mess. Well, I don't work with them. So do, are you able to see later like the, the actual people's names of who? Oh, I'm able to see it now. Okay, cool. If they're interested in the change topic, I want to ping them after. <laughs> yeah. One minute till show time. Now, did you want to control your own slide deck, or did you just want to tell me next slide? Okay. Can do it. Okay. Well, where, is that fine? You've been doing it for everybody. Have okay. you been doing it for everybody? It's a mix. Like Rich Finelli, I make sure I always control his slide deck. Bless his heart, he and technology. 
don't always get along. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the FNCC's um, webinar, What is in it for me? Addressing the people side of change presented by Andrea Sanchez. Everyone has been muted for audio quality. If you do have any questions during this webinar, please type them into the question box and we'll be happy to field them during the, and during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Also, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the FNCC website. Here's the FMC's vision and mission statement. And also, the FMCC provides many services to the FM community, such as ask the expert, find a consultant, locate a speaker, and online educational resources. You may find more information at their website, fmcc.ifma.org. And we would like to thank our sponsors. And also, I forgot to mention that if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint today, you can download a PDF version on your control panel under handouts. And now the reason we're all here to, together today is for to celebrate World FM Day, which FMCC is celebrating as World FM Week. And so we're thrilled to put together a virtual conference of over 30 sessions. And here are some of the presenters I'll have and will be presenting through the, through the next couple of days. And today our presenter is Andrea Sanchez. She's Chief Marketing Officer and Organization uh, Chief Marketing Officer and Organizational Change for IFMA. Andrea has worked for IFMA since 2007. Within her role, she oversees internal communications, marketing, social media, web, videography, as well as organizational change initiatives. Prior to her current role, she was editor of the FMJ for eight years and oversaw the launch of IFMA's Knowledge Library online. In her spare time, she enjoys writing and hosting a weekly Twitter chat, hashtag dare to be, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on personal leadership. Her passions include change management and transformational leadership. She aims to inspire others and organizations to become the best versions of themselves. Now it's my honor to turn it over to Andrea. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Joshua. It's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you to FMCC for inviting me to speak on one of my passions, which is everything change, change management. Um, first of all, before we get started, happy World of Fem Day. It's an honor to be able to work for IFMA and to be representing and w working alongside such talented individuals, those that work in the built environment. This day is for you, and we thank you for everything that you do. Today, we're going to talk about what's in it for you or what's in it for me. Change is inevitable. We go through change every single day, probably every single hour of our lives, whether we notice it or not. And there's some objectives that we're going to keep in the back of the mind as we go through the presentation. Number one, we're going to examine the phases people, people go through when presented with change. Two, let's learn about the what's in it for me. Three. Let's discuss what I call the role of dimensional communication. It's a different kind of communication, more than just a traditional way of communication that could help with the change process. And then four, I'm going to end it with some tips on how you can get people on board with change, or at least help them get there and try to start accepting or listening to it. Shall we get started? Let's go. For this particular slide, now before we, we dive into the meat, um, if you have a piece of paper, a pen, anything to write on, that would be great. We're going to do a short exercise. If you don't, just visualize it in your mind. But what I want you to do is, looking at this picture, we're looking at wealth, we're looking at money, we're looking at currency, we're looking at if you could buy anything in the world, what would it be? So on your piece of paper, Let's assume you inherited all this wealth. And I want you to draw what you think would be your ideal house if money was no limit, your ideal place to live. Go ahead and draw it. What does that look like? It's an opportunity to imagine and have your dreams come true. Oh, and when you're drawing that house, include in the background, whether it's you know, in the beach, by the mountain, lake, 
put some scenery around there. You can feel the drawing. So as you're drawing, actually, you know what? I, I, I think, let, let's scratch the house. Let's pretend, because houses, you're limited, right? So if they were talking about World FM, they were talking about people all over the world. So draw your ideal plane instead, your ideal plane or form of transportation. So you could go anywhere in the world. What would it have inside? Maybe you want to live in the plane. I don't know. Try that. That way you have wings to go, to go anywhere. And now, now I don't want to feel, seem, come across as if you have all this money, you have to spend it because there are people less fortunate. So for those less fortunate, it's nice to be able to give and show gratitude. So really, let, let's, let's just go with another idea. What is your favorite charity? How would you give away this money? Live in the house that you are, but how would you give away some of this money? Write down or symbol or, or anything like that. Okay, so we're going to stop this exercise before I frustrate you even further. What were your emotions when we were going through this exercise? Was it one of these? Shock, denial, anger, frustration. Frustration that you had to keep changing and changing and changing direction when you were focused. Did you just accept the fact towards the end that really you were just frustrated and you just gave up on the exercise and that's it? You didn't know exactly what the point was, what this thing was, where this thing was going, and it's a complete waste of time. Some people may have checked out. Some people may have enjoyed the challenge and just kept going. And, and some people may still be drawing because they're, they're still in that fantasy. So that's great. But this is just one little example of change, uh, as, as little as changing your focus on what I asked you to draw because, and, and it could be as huge as, as when you go back into your corporations or your business or even your personal life. It could be a life event. It could be a, a move to a different country. It could be a, another, something simple as a change in hairstyle or it could be a, a, the way that you work in your office, um, a new work structure. So these are just some of the examples and the phases that people go through when they deal with change. First of all, if you think of any example in your head, whether personal or professional, more than likely when you hear some news that's of a change, you, you, you can't believe it or you're in shock. Could be a good surprise or it could be a bad surprise or you're just in shock. You don't know how to accept it. Then if you look through the different phases, it kind of looks like similar phases of stages of grief, if you see that. And for some people, they go through it pretty fast. Some people get stuck in a certain phase for a while, and that's okay. There, there's no right or wrong way to go through change. It depends on the individual. But this is where companies go wrong, or entities go wrong, or maybe even individuals, maybe family members go wrong, that they feel that just because they go through change this way and communicate it one time, then every single other person goes through it the same way. That is what we call the people side of change. There are so many processes. There's so much great literature. There's so much research. There's so much great expertise out there to read about, about how to go through change management and go through change. All those, I love that stuff. I love to read it and has been very useful in my journey. But at the same time, you can't, you can't do apples to apples with every single person. If you're dealing with change, you have to come up with how to manage that change. For say, let's say um, IFMA. I work for IFMA. So we have 60 plus employees, 60 or so employees. So if we're going through some sort of change within IFMA, yes, there are two types. There's organizational change and then there's individual change, the people side of change. The organizational change would would deal with a, a change management plan deal, dealing with the organizational change as a whole and the steps of what the organization is going to do. More often than not, the people side of change, the individual change is, is kind of assumed or set as a given. And, and that's with everything because it's human nature. So if you're talking about change management plan in a company or an entity, there's one. But if you're talking about individual or personal size of change, there's 60 plus 
change management plans in, in for say ISMA. And that's where it takes more time and that's what the people side of change comes with. So when people hear of change or they hear it, they hear the shock, it's often like, me first, no you, you, you go ahead first, you try it out. No, no one wants to be the first to try it out or no, or some, some don't even want to try it out. There's hesitation. And that's normal. That's part of being human. Um, as humans, we, that's the way instinctively that we are. We always um, try to protect ourselves, be in the safety zone, be comfortable, and we assume that something that's unfamiliar um, we fear or we put up our defenses and um, so that's pretty much when we hear of change unfortunately when we see something change or hear of a change coming along instinctively some as most of the time fear is the emotion that that takes over even though the change may be good it takes a sec another second to realize that perhaps there's opportunity in the change one reason people resist change is because they focus on what they have to give up instead of what they have to gain. Again, instinct, instinct. You may not realize you do this. Most people do. If you don't, congratulations, because you caught yourself. Um, but it, it's, it's just human instinct. Once we switch our mindset and really focus, even if it would be the worst news ever, because there are valid reasons to feel like you don't want to change. There, it, the mindset is up to you. You control how you want to feel. You may feel stuck, but you have control over giving yourself a different outlook and finding the opportunity or finding a, a bright spot in that change. If it's not there, make it up in your mind so, so you can find something that motivates you through that change. So if you're trying to, to change your mindset or, or find that golden ticket or find that motivation that will get you through that change, even if it's a change that you don't want to go through, there are choices. You have more power than you think. You can either Resist the change, go away, find something else, ignore it, and then you become miserable and you become irrelevant, or you go ahead and, and go along with the change and find a way to make the change work. You may not agree with it, but you find opportunities to make yourself fit into the change puzzle. So say you're trying to be positive and you're really trying to find an opportunity in that change. Well. Come over here. I'm ready. Are you ready to make the change? You're ready. You're ready. But as you see in the picture, how do I do it? And so often than not, we find ourselves in this position, and employees find themselves in this position, or even family members, if we're talking about personal things, is I get what you're trying to say. I like the direction, but I don't know how to do it. How do we get there? And I think a lot of the change messages, or a lot of the communication period, fails because people are pumped, but then they go back to their normal selves and their normal business because, yeah, it was a great idea, but what's the action? What are the next steps? So there's different phases to the change. You have to prep for the change, come up with a strategy. You have to manage it, give the training, the coaching, and then you have to reinforce it and see what are the gaps and get the feedback. So connecting change to business results. I refer to this as the four P's for those of you that like to read. Um, and project name, purpose, particulars, and people. So when we're breaking down a change, you're trying to figure out, okay, what is it that we're calling this change? If, you, if it's in a business, say, in facility management, let's say you want to have a more collaborative workspace. So that's the change or that's the project that you were asked to handle. The purpose, why are we changing? Well, perhaps we want a more collaborative workspace because um, the strategy is to increase efficiencies and perhaps increase staff engagement. What are the particulars? What exactly are we changing in order to increase efficiencies and staff engagement? Well, perhaps it's the team structure. Perhaps it's the office structure, the way the desks are laid out, the way that technology is set up. Perhaps it's an open office, going from a closed to open office. Perhaps it's more tech enhancement or giving the flexibility of having remote capabilities for your employees or having TV screens and, and videos available when you hold meetings so people can see each other on camera and read nonverbal signals as well and, and feel more connected. So who will be changing? The people. It's last, but perhaps it's the most important component of this whole process. Who will be changing? If it's if you're trying to change a, 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 an office or a company and, and their collaborative space, all of staff will be affected. 
And, and consequently, if, if the staff goes through this change and they go through this change well and they accept it, it will hopefully create greater efficiencies resulting in greater productivity, resulting in greater customer experience, which makes the customer happy. So <clears throat> it all depends on the people. If the people side does not follow through, then you, you could have the best strategy, the best change plan ever. It, it's not going to work. So as I was saying, the people, think about a change project that you're going through. What percentage of your project outcomes are linked to people? If it's 100%, then we better make sure we pay attention to the people side of change. And we need to also communicate and manage those expectations with other individuals that are perhaps rushing the outcome. Because people take time. People are messy. People are complex. Like I mentioned, it's not one organizational change management plan. It may be just one, but it, it's, if you have 60 so employees, it's 60 plus individual change management plans. And that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of coaching. That takes a lot of listening. That takes a lot of one-on-one. That takes a lot of feedback, identifying gaps. So the people side of change is extremely important. So now that you have been told, think differently. Let's, let's, let's go about a change. I want you to change the way we do this process. I want a, a more collaborative environment. OK, well, this is the boss in the picture. I want you to find a bold and innovative way to do everything exactly the same way it's been done for 25 years. You know, some people may laugh at that. Some people may find what's so funny about that. And, it, and all the emotions that you may be feeling are valid because you can't assume everyone knows the how to change. You, you can't even assume everyone knows what change is. For some people, change is quite drastic. Change is completely redoing uh, what their comfort zone is, completely just mindset, uh, resources, etc. And for some, change isn't a big deal. They feel like they can still be who they are and, and do what they do, but maybe it's just smaller little things. So we all need to be in the, on the same page of what the change really is and what change really means. So we need to start from there. Because if you keep doing what you're doing and people are expecting all these changes, um, there's going to be some negative outcome uh, to make sure that we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. So everybody wants to change the world but nobody wants to change. <laughs> um, we've all been in those meetings that, or, or those reunions or those chats or those phone calls where everyone's like, God, you know, I wish this worked this way, and it would be so much more helpful if we did it like this, or it would be great if this existed. And those, those are always great conversations, but who's going to be the first to do it? Most people think that they, they can't make, they can't be the one inventing so-and-so invention. But we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that one person that took the risk to think differently and make the change. Um, we would still be in, in that would still be in the, the Stone Ages. So it's all about comfort zones. I mean, it's it's why wouldn't you? Why would you want to get away from your comfort zone? It's it's it feels great to feel comfortable, but if we don't often extend ourselves beyond our comfort zone, then we stop growing and we stop learning. And for some, they may feel perfectly fine with that. But if we really want to see more changes in the world and more uh, better uh, technology and, and just better living in general um, and, and, and progress, then someone has to change. And maybe maybe it's you. Maybe it's you, whether you like well, or know it or not, maybe it's you that has the secret to the next big change that will make everything more comfortable. So connecting change to business results. Once again, if people don't change how they do their job, then it really doesn't matter what specific changes are implemented. Yes, you could have all the cameras in the room. You could have videos available for your workplace. You can have the open seating. But if, if, there, are, if there is this one room that has a door and people prefer to work in there instead of the open seating, or they don't use their video cameras, then, then what good is the change? You're pretty much working the same way you did before, even though the resources are there. So your change is, is not going to happen. So if people don't change how they do their job, then we ultimately won't achieve what we set out to do from the beginning. 
Again, it depends on the people. People, people, people. So, it's doing good on time? Doing good. All right. So, I want you to get out your piece of paper again. And I promise I, I, I won't be uh, torturous this time, but this will be another interesting exercise. So, with your pen and your piece of paper, I want you to write your signature three times write your name three times or sign it. Assuming that almost everyone is done, I want you to pick up your pen pencil again and write your signature another three times. Perfect. So now, keep your pen, but I want you to change hands. So if you wrote with your right hand, I want you to change with your left hand and vice versa. So with your opposite hand that you used before, write your signature again three times. And this is the time where I wish I had a video and audio because I love to hear people's comments and see how they're doing this. So I, I did this presentation with our staff a week ago, and it was completely eye-opening because um, I, I asked, you know, what, 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 what was I, what are your feelings when you did, when you did it, when you were asked to do it with your opposite hand? And most were saying, it made me think harder. I really have to focus more. I have to change the way I hold my hand or I was uncomfortable. And some of the process, some of the comments during the process when people were writing with their opposite hand was, oh, I need some help. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to try to speed up so this whole exercise will be over. And then others were like, I, I feel like I'm back to kindergarten or I'm five years old and just learning how to write. So this is all natural human emotions and comments that came out during that process. Be interested to hear if you uh, if you had any other comments on that. So now I want you to pick up your pen and write your signature three more times. This is the last time, I promise. So now I'm interested, I'm interested to hear, you probably cannot let me know, but think about it yourself. I'm interested to see how many people went back to their original hand or how many people wrote their signature with their uncomfortable hand or awkward hand. And this whole thing is just a representation of just change. We often talk about the change, change feels awkward feels uncomfortable, we talk about it, we want to do it, and then we go out and we, you may have a seminar, you may have a training session, and then you go out and, and go on with your day and go back to business as usual. I bet you when you go back to business as usual, if you were told to of a specific change, you may have completely forgotten about the change. Or if you were asked to use video, you may not use video because it's more comfortable not to use it or even if there was some sort of communication that was critical, that was announced in your company or anywhere, you go back and you just go back to business as usual. And it's because that's what, feel com that's what feels comfortable. There may be a structure change. There may be a, a resources change. But it takes time to adapt, and it takes time for the mind to, to really hone into the new way of doing things. So that's why it takes reminders. It takes people supporting each other. It takes cheerleaders like, you're still writing, we're still writing with that hand. You need to switch over to this hand. This is how we're all doing it now. So not that you have to switch hands, but that's just an example. So that's, a, that's just one indication of people mean well, and they may be excited about a change, but when they go back to their everyday, they go back to their everyday on what feels comfortable, what their comfort zone is, or what they feel like 
what they feel like they have expertise on. And in this case, it was writing with your dominant hand. So if you really want to reinforce a new way uh, and, and making it feel comfortable, it takes time. Because the more you do things, the more comfortable it feels. And, and I, know, I know we've all been through that. So this is the part where I take from textbook, for those of you that like uh, textbooks. And for those of you that have heard of PROSCI, P-R-O-S-C-I, they stand for Pro Science, and they are experts in change management, which I took a lot of this content of. Um, they have what's called an ADCAR model. ADCAR is the first letter of each of the words that you see at the very top, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. And they believe that this is um, this is good stuff, that this is the process of how people um, start to deal with change. So when you think of a past change that you announced or you think of something new that you wanted to announce to your staff or your family, etc., that first step is awareness. It gives a communication, whether it's verbal, written, however it may be. After the awareness, the for a change to be successful, there must be some desire. Like, why should I change? What's in it for me? Um, if there's no desire and people don't connect with the change, you're still stuck in awareness, meaning they not, may not be listening to your message of what the change is. Curious to, curious, um, to hear, um, if you think back, how many people have been in the position that you communicated something, whether it's to your staff, to your team, to your children, to your spouse, and you communicated it. And then they, they come back and say, oh, I never heard you say that. And, and you get frustrated. And you may have very well said that, but they very well may really think they haven't heard it. And you both are right. And it's, it's because the awareness, even though it was communicated, it's a one-way communication. You have to have True communication is two-way, meaning there's communication, you verbalize it, you write it, but there's also acceptance. There's a desire to read it. There's a desire to give feedback. There's a desire to notice it. So if, if there's no desire there, you're still stuck in awareness. So that's why it's important to communicate, communicate, re-communicate, find other channels, keep communicating, find other angles of the what's in it for me, the why, so people are, oh, maybe I should pay attention to this. Let me read more. So that's why if there's no desire, you're going to be stuck in awareness forever. After the desire, OK, I want to do this. I know what's in it for me, so how do I do it? So that's the little picture of the guy trying to jump to the other side of the cliff. How do I do it? So now that you have their attention, they actually want to do it, you have to let them know how to do it, whether it's through additional resources you're given, whether it's whatever it may be. They need to understand the how. You need to equip them. Once they're equipped, then they have the ability. So and the ability also means that you lead by example, that you show them the way. You show different ways of, of applying that knowledge um, and not, not leave it on the, to the textbooks, but actually make it come to life. Walk the talk. And then, of course, is reinforcement. Just because you gave all the knowledge out, people are into the change, they're upset at it. If, if there's no continuous communication, if there's no continuous uh, reminders, cheerleading, etc. Just like you're keep writing with your left hand, you can do it. Um, people are just going to revert back, and that's normal. That's human nature until it becomes their new comfort zone. So it's, I thought this this particular diagram was interesting because so many people and so many companies out there just put out a message and then assume that you can go straight to reinforcement or assume that they can go straight to ability. And they may ignore the desire and the knowledge. Or they may do all these steps at once. And really, if you're trying to implement a change well, especially if it's more complicated, it takes time. And the awareness and desire are probably the, 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 the stages that take the most time. And you may be, you always have to reemphasize the awareness, even if you are in reinforcement. So. The bad news is there's no magic button to change. You can't announce a change, give everyone a button, and switch it on. And everyone understands it, and they go. That's the bad news. The good news is there's always opportunities in change. And if you mess up the way you communicate a change, there's always a chance to start over. 
there's always a way to communicate again and again and again. The key is authenticity. The key is connecting with your people. The key is listening and really finding those gaps and trying again. If people gave up and didn't try again, again, we would be in the Stone Ages. We wouldn't have airplanes. We wouldn't have all these wonderful things that we have now that make our lives easier. So just realize that change is more complex than just a button and a one communication that you move forward. I'm sure we've all met that one person that thinks there's that magic button. Research finding. This is, again, from the ProSci organization dealing with workplace change. So as you can see, people is a theme again. The number one obstacle to success for a major change project is employee resistance because the ineffective management of the people side of change. So once again, people make or break the change despite you having the most optimal, amazing, change management plan. If they don't change how they do their jobs, the details, the whys are irrelevant. You need to put your people first. So did we all hear that? People first. So during change, I, I kind of wove this in in the past slides, um, but there is one particular part of the communication process that's the most important and sometimes taken for granted. You know what that is? is it verbal? Eye contact? Nonverbal? Actually, it's all of the above, but the most important one is listening. We often feel like with change, we have to talk, 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 or print, 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 or send, 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 send the email. But we sometimes are so passionate and so ready to move forward, so excited that we don't take the time to listen or get feedback to determine what our gaps are. Listening enables you to hear the people side of change, what their emotions are, whether it's fear, excitement. Like I mentioned, they, there may be one change management plan for the organization, but there are multiple change management plans, one for each individual, because everyone's different. Now, the one thing that we all have in common is that we're all human. We're all human, we're all people, we all have emotions. And when we listen, not only should we listen with the ears, but we should listen with the eyes. Emotions are communicated through nonverbal signals, and that's a very important piece that sometimes we don't realize in the change process. So a change in behavior begins with a change in the heart. So once again, how are we all connected? We're all human. Humans have emotions. The heart. Everyone has a heart. Whether we realize that or not, or whether we're mad at someone or not, like, God, that person has no heart. They do. Everyone has a heart, and everyone gets their feelings hurt, whether you realize it or not. Even if it's a very um, successful businessman, the head of the company, or it's a five-year-old child. Everyone has feelings, but they express it in different ways, and some choose not to express it. But it's part of human nature. So when you're speaking to people and communicating the change, communicating the why, the what's in it for them, yes, there are reasons of why things have to change, say, in a corporation, or say, the example of having a more collaborative workspace to increase efficiencies, etc. But also try and hone in to the why that connects with people, that connects with the heart? What's the, the, the why that's beyond efficiencies? I mean, efficiency sounds great, yeah, but is there, is there like a really an emotional connection with that? What if you dig deeper of the, with the why? And maybe if there's efficiencies, and maybe if we're all working more of an, an open environment, um, a more collaborative environment, maybe we're able to greater value each other's talent. Value. Now, there's a great word. Feeling valued is a great, it's someone people have in common. Feeling valued, feeling included, feeling important, feeling like you matter. Now that's a deeper reason of what's in it for you. So with every change, think a little deeper. And that's why you find these successful marketing campaigns or companies that those that really go deep into the people side or emotional marketing is those that really are successful. 
So I, I challenge you to think of the what it, what's in it for me in a different kind of way. For those of you that love um, organizational change or leadership books or leadership gurus, etc., um, Simon Sinek, I'm a huge fan, and this is, if you've heard of him, he has the golden circle. And his, is, his whole premise is around the why. So often we communicate the what, what's the project, what's the change. Sometimes the next step, if, if we do it well, we actually go into how. How do we go about the change? What's changing? But the, the, the key nugget is the why. The why, the purpose, but the people purpose, not the corporate speak purpose, even though that's also needed. It's the people purpose. He gave an example, which I thought was great, is Apple, um, their, their slogan back in the late 90s, early 2000s was think different. And that was their why. Like, so when they did promotions, they used think different. You didn't really get to understand that they sold computers until after the fact. They wanted to appeal to people's emotion of those who wanted to be unique and different. And then, by the way, we sell computers, too. And so I thought that's a different way of communicating what you're all about, what you're representing, and why you exist. So rethinking messaging and distribution. So this is, um, this is Andrea's mind. <laughs> This is not anywhere in research. So I was thinking, since I, I've been in communications 20 plus years, and um, there's been a lot of challenges and a lot of great opportunities. And communication evolves. Communication changes just like everything else. Unfortunately, we live in a time where there's so many additional channels, like social media and video, and um, going into even virtual reality, augmented reality, which is amazing. So I was thinking. Let's look at the multidimensional communications and how that affects the change process of the communication. We are all used to 1D, which I call 1D, which is communications with perhaps one person, sharing an idea with one person, maybe two, maybe a few people in a room, or maybe it's just communication with self. You have an idea. You get decided about it, but you don't communicate it with anyone else. The idea stays within you. The idea stays within you and that person, or the idea stays within the room. It goes nowhere. If we add more dimensions, more depth, then it can have a little bit more of an audience. So that's what I call 2D, which is more of what you see as the traditional communication methods that we've all have been used to, which is put this in a newsletter. Let's get an ad in a magazine. Let's use media. Um, perhaps we can run an ad. You see commercials. We're all used to that kind of. Um, 2D communication. And that does get a message across, but in a way it gets the message across one dimensionally, or, or in one, one way, meaning that people don't have the opportunity right there and then to give feedback. They may be thinking it, but the person that gave the message has no idea what the response has been. So that's often when you get those people feeling frustrated, like we have been communicating this change for the past six months in our competitors or our customers are just now um, realizing it, or they said they never heard of it, and now they're frustrated at us. So yes, you may have been communicating the change, but it has been a one-way communication. Have you really been giving a chance for feedback, um, people's side of change, and to give more um, time to allow for communication of any gaps or sensitivities, et cetera? If you go a step further, which Frankly, we can do more of this now because of the tools is I call it the 3D, which is more of the opportunities of, of getting those channels that you can interact with. So this is, you may have heard this as like non-traditional approaches, disruptive approaches to marketing or communications. And this is when true engagement begins. This is really using either social media or other channels that you get real-time feedback on, whether you hold a webinar or um, that you can type in responses, or if there's audio, you can talk back and forth with the presenter, or if you have virtual town halls, which we have been having here at ISMA, to emphasize more uh, the changes that we are going through uh, as far as the association. So members can actually ask our president and CEO questions one-on-one -on -one, rather than just read about the announcement in the newsletter. Ideally, if this takes off, engagement, engagement, engagement multiplies, you see what I call 4D or more multi-dimensional, and this is when we get into the future, like the augmented reality, the virtual reality. But it's also, you don't have to have all this technology. It could be just things going viral. When you hear things going viral, it's because there's interest. 
and it's word of mouth, it's word of mouth, and word of mouth. And if you're on social media, it may be a retweet, and a retweet, and a retweet, or a share. Um, so we have communication if done well, and really taking the people side into effect can really multiply um, more than any paid ad can. So there's certainly power in, in the power of people and communicating that way. So lastly, um, I promised I would give you some tips to get people on board with change. Now, not everyone will be on board with change, and that's okay. People have the right to be themselves and feel uh, and follow the path that they would like to follow. But to increase your chances, I want to give you some tips. So number one, we went over this already. Lead from the why. Yes, the, the corporate why or the book why, but also the why that touches the heart, the why that connects to emotion. Number two, risk over communication. Again, don't assume because you communicated, everyone heard you. Say it again and again and again and again. Use different channels. Be visible. Never assume something is obvious just because you think it's obvious. Um, you can't go wrong with over-communicating. Three, make change fun. So it's all about the approach with anything that you do. So if you have kids, you understand this. Um, if, you want, if you want to present something new to them, you've got to make it fun. If you want them to get dressed for school, you've got to make it into a game. So <laughs> it's, I have three kids, so I, I completely know how that goes. So this should go hand in hand with your change approaches with, with anybody. It's not, you don't, you want to be genuine at the same time. If you have concerns, then let's address the concerns together. But also, if you feel excited about it, people will feel more of a chance to be excited about it. Um, emotions are contagious. And you can influence group emotions in the way you present things, whether you present it as scary, as boring, or as exciting. So change should always be tied to opportunities to growing and learning. The what's in it for me. If, if there's no opportunities for growth and learning, then you can't have chances to celebrate success. So, and that, that's the fun stuff. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to that. Make it safe. So protect your people. Reassure people risk won't be punished. And when changing, I mean, we all know that we put ourselves at risk when we change because it's something we're not used to doing. So we, you know, when you wrote your signature with the opposite hand, it probably didn't come out exactly how you wanted it to come out. But you took the risk and you tried. So we need to be human and realize that it takes risk and practice makes perfect, or there's no such thing as perfect, actually. Practice makes good enough until it becomes your own new comfort zone. So don't focus solely on the consequences of failure. Acknowledge anxiety, both spoken and silent anxiety. So that's why it's important to observe nonverbal communication. You may be a CEO of a company, or the, the boss of your group, or the head of your family, and you announce a certain change, or a way things have to be done. People. You may ask, are there any questions? People may not say anything, but that doesn't mean, silence doesn't necessarily mean agreement. So again, those individual change management plans, you explain the organizational one, now you have to follow up with the people. You have to acknowledge discomfort of being in unfamiliar territory, but while simultaneously keeping people focused on what the change is going to be. So number six. Encourage smart risk taking. So what do I mean by smart risk taking? Ask yourself and ask others, what's the worst thing that could happen? What would I do if the worst did happen? What can happen if I did nothing? But some people were so focused on maybe the negative of the change, but what happens if we don't change? Do we become irrelevant? Um, does the competition get ahead of us? Do we lose an opportunity? People are wired toward caution. So we need to remind ourselves of, of these questions that perhaps make us think in different ways. Seven, nudge people into discomfort. So think of situations as you were growing up or in through your career um, that used to make you so nervous, but now you've done them so many times, or you've been in that situation so many times that it's a piece of cake for you. It, it's, you don't think twice about it. It's, 
you're used to it and you don't get nervous at all. So the same thing goes with any change and writing with the opposite hand. So if you do it enough or if you're being exposed to it enough times, it makes the frightening actually familiar. And then appoint change ambassadors. So it's, it's, it, we often hear it all starts at the top. Yes, the top is, is important. They need to lead the way, walk the talk, but also it, change also is dependent on people. And you need to appoint people that are also understanding of the change, get the change, and are able to communicate the change in different ways that expresses a why that people can relate to. So if you're at the very top, you may be communicating in a very corporate kind of way, but if you get other change ambassadors within the company with different positions that have closer associations or closer connections with other people in the organization, they're able to know more of the individual angles, individual change management, uh, how those people react to change and communicate in a way that makes more sense to them, especially if they don't understand the what's in it for me or the why, or maybe get more of the concerns and get more of the feedback if people are not comfortable speaking with the top. Reward brave behavior, number nine, not just results. Yes, so it takes, again, it takes a lot of risk for people to step out of their comfort zone. So not every step will move you in the right direction. Some steps will move you backwards, some sideways, but that's okay, we're all human. But if we say that's okay, then truly walk the talk that it is okay. Don't automatically get mad at someone because they made a mistake. What, what you say, you need to live. Uh, if you're a leader and if you make a mistake, then you need to acknowledge that you made a mistake as well. So acknowledge people when they act bravely, in front of a group, through an email, through a nice handwritten note, etc. Lastly, lead by example. Sometimes this means risking your own safety. Show that you're willing to take risks yourself. Uh, not trying to come across as perfect, that you know it all, um, even though you, you may think you know it all, there's always other sides of uh, the communication. There's always perhaps other gaps or other emotions that you may not realize that are part of the change that have to be dealt with. So, lastly, as a summary, change. There's no magic button. There's no magic door. It takes time. And it's all about the people. So make sure you, you invest in the people and you invest in, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's individual listening and getting to know what makes people comfortable. And change really begins with me, begins with you. If, um, until you see a what's in it for you, what's in it for me, or if there's a desire, there's not going to be any change. So you are in control whether you want to change or not. You are the one that makes things possible for you. That's all I have. If you do have any questions, please type them into the question box on your control panel, and we'll be happy to present them to Andrea. We have just a couple minutes before the close of the presentation. And so we wait to see if any questions come through. I'm going to go through a couple of slides, but please go ahead and type your questions into the chat box. I do just want to let you know some upcoming webinars for today. Our next one is going to be Coaching, Developing FM Professionals and Teams with Marnie Kluke. So that will be at 1 p.m. Central Time here in the U.S. And you can see the list of the other ones that are coming up as well. I would love to see you guys on those, that webinar. The FMCC does want to let you be aware that there is an app out there that they've created. You can get it at Google Play or the iTunes Store. And it looks like we have a question. It says, do you have any recommendations on outside reading materials? Oh, do I? I have tons. Um, actually, you can email me, andrea.sanchez at isma.org. If not, if you look at the presentation, if you go back and you download it, um, the things that I cite, I, I usually uh, cite it there. ProSci is a great organization. If you go to www.prosci.com, and it's, again, cited on my presentation, they have so much information on change management and articles and presentations and videos. Um, Simon Sinek, if you're really interested in the what's in it for me and the why, he has three books. He has a website. Um, that, that's really good stuff. And he also has a lot of TED Talks. So I would look him up. Um, 
There's also, if you're a fan of social media and just going through change and the people side of things and what he calls team human, I recommend Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, if you're on social media, you know who he is. Um, he, uh, he's all about putting people first in everything that you do. So those are just a few, but if you want a few more, feel free to email me. Thank you. And how do you spell Simon's last name? S-I-N-E-K. Thank you. And the FMCC is always looking for volunteers, so if you'd love to join their STAG team, we'd love to have you. You contact Ricardo. His email is on the slide on your screen. And the FMCC does like to make everyone aware of the other councils and communities that are out there in the IFMA family. That they're great resources for these industries. And I want to thank you, Andrea, for joining us for a great presentation today for World FM Day. And I want to thank everyone on the audience for joining us today. You have a great rest of your day and enjoy World FM Week.